I cannot believe it has taken me 230 episodes of this dang podcast to have Eliza Blank, founder of The Sill, on to share her incredible journey. If you interact with the houseplant community online at all, you have likely been impacted by the effect that The Sill has had on the online houseplant community. And also, you've probably seen their content on their huge Instagram page and or website. Because The Sill was one of the original houseplant brands that exploded in popularity before the pandemic when houseplants became popular. The founder, Eliza Blank, has the most incredible female founder story of seeing a need in the market for a houseplant brand and growing it to the nationally recognized name that it is now. And I think it's interesting to hear these stories because we on the consumer side have been affected by them, right? By the brands in this industry. I recently got to sit down with Eliza for a live taping of the podcast at the Northwestern Flower and Garden Festival in Seattle to get all the details about how she grew the seed of an idea into the sill. It's such a great conversation. So get ready for all the plant puns and come along. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy. Hello, plant friends. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. If you're new here, I'm Maria. I'm the host of the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, and I'm here to help you grow joy in your life by caring for plants successfully. And if you're an OG or repeat listener, welcome home. Welcome back, my plant friend. Thank you for showing up to this podcast on a weekly basis. I'm honored to be a part of your journey. When it comes to journeys, the sill has probably affected all of us. We probably all know who the sill is. It's one of the largest plant brands. And Eliza is the most impressive and supportive founder I know. We talk about our personal relationship in the beginning of this podcast episode. So I'll wait, but I'm so excited to highlight this amazing plant lady on the show today. We did this interview live, so the audio is going to sound different. It's still great. We were on stage, on the main stage at the Northwestern Flower and Garden Festival in Seattle. It was incredible. Plant Friends, it was this enormous flower show, flower festival in Seattle that had a million plant vendors, plant accessories, all sorts of talks. You know, Eliza and I were one of the talks, and it was so inspiring, and it was so fun to just be around so many other plant people. I finally got a wishlist plant of mine, a coconut orchid, Maxillaria tenufolia. It's an orchid whose blooms smell like coconuts. They also nickname it the pina colada orchid. I've never had an orchid before. I'm super excited to try and care for it. So stay tuned on my Instagram to see how it grows. And without further ado, I want to dive into this conversation I have with Eliza. And if you don't know The Sill, you should go follow them on Instagram. Go to thesill.com. They have a lot of educational resources for you. It's where I learned so much in my beginner plant parenthood. The first six months of me caring for houseplants was me going on thesill.com every single day and reading every blog that they have and like every care guide for their houseplants. That truly was the beginning of my plant parent journey. So I hope that this conversation inspires you. Those of you who are entrepreneurs in the plant space, those of you who are female founders, maybe, or just, you know, boss babes, right? So without further ado, here's Eliza. Do we have any houseplant lovers in the audience? Raise your hands if you like houseplants. <laughs> Woo! Yes. I see someone raising two hands. Oh, I see, definitely I someone see, I see like some house plants. Fingers. Yes. All okay. Right. Scream out. What's your favorite houseplant that you're growing right now? Yes, classic. Yes. Hoyas. Pothos, Hoyas, Snake. Love it. Mm -hmm. Well, we're so lucky to be joined by the godmother, fairy godmother of houseplants, I like to call you, Eliza from The Sill. For those of you that don't know, my name is Maria. I'm the host of the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. If you like podcasts and you like plants, you're going to love the show. And I introduced the podcast at the beginning of this interview because I want to start this conversation with Eliza because we're celebrating Eliza and the sill and what she's grown today. 
I, as a planty entrepreneur, female entrepreneur in the space, would not be here without the support that Eliza and her company have given me over the years. She is one of the founders and one of the main establishers of houseplants in the space. And when I started my podcast, I just remember your team saying, how can we help? Can we put you on our social media? Can we give you our experts to come on your show? And I think that speaks to really who you are as an entrepreneur and speaks to the amazing brand that you've built. So I feel so lucky that we get to be here talking today. Thank you. One of the best parts of having this business is to meet other amazing plant people. Yeah. I feel the same way. Truly. So when we're talking about plant people, let's start with you as a plant person. How did you get into houseplants? Have you always loved them? What does your journey with plants look like as a hobbyist before this all started? When I grew up, plants were very much the backdrop to my childhood. Mm. And it was a little bit of a mystery, right? My mother just tended to the plants. They weren't really my responsibility, Mm. but they were there and they were an integral part of our household. But my mother also just had this like magic about her. She Mm. just knew. Now she knew because she had 40 years of experience testing and trialing and lots of errors and such. And so I didn't really think about it until I left home. And for me, I left home and moved to New York City Mm -hmm. where Plants are far and few between. Yeah, concrete jungle. Yeah, exactly. In fact, I went to New York for school and my freshman year dorm room was on the 11th floor. And the tallest building in my hometown was probably three stories. Yeah. So just that literal disconnect from nature, I really felt that deeply. And so I wanted to get into plants. I wanted to cultivate my own collection. Mm -hmm. And I realized I actually had nowhere to start. I did not know what to do because... My mother was the green thumb. And so I found myself making mistake after mistake and not really knowing where to go. Mm. So find a plant one place, find a plant or another place, find potting soil a third place. And I had this moment where I felt really compelled to say there must be a better way. Yeah. And so the sill was born in 2012, almost 12 years ago, which is crazy. No joke. Yeah. No joke. I was 26, and I will say there's not been a single day that's been easy, but it really resonated with people right away. Mm, Definitely. As you were definitely, I would say, probably one of the first adopters in the houseplant space. What was it like making houseplants a thing when previously, when you thought gardening, you thought outdoor, you thought vegetable, you thought perennials, you didn't think indoor gardening. So what was that like to show up trying to build a brand in a space where the houseplants weren't that much of a thing yet. No, that's absolutely right. So I think twofold, right? I think on one hand, I felt like I had just discovered mm. this category, which of course I did not discover. Yeah, of course. But I I felt very compelled to elevate this category and define it for a modern person or a young person or a person living in a constrained situation like mm-hmm. my first apartment. And that was really exciting. It didn't really occur to me the challenge that might be given that the consumer was really thinking about plants outdoors, mm. whether that's just because I was naive or not, whatever. Yeah. I was just really excited to tackle that because it was a problem that I had experienced and I really wanted to solve for. But I also felt like no one was going to garden in the same way that my mother gardens, mm. which now that I'm older, I don't actually think is true anymore. Okay. But, you know, my mother will spend six leisurely hours on a Sunday, like tending to her garden and actually probably more than six. And I, at the time, did not spend six consecutive hours doing anything. Mm. So what was my connection going to be? And so houseplants, for that reason, became sort of this really easy, small, low-risk, tangible way Mm -hmm. for young people, especially living in urban environments, to get involved. I'm so curious. What did your houseplant collection look like before the sill became a thing when you were just the hobbyist filling her her house with houseplants? What did it look like? A lot of dead plants. Yeah. (laughs) It's interesting because houseplants now has, you know, so I think about houseplants through the lens of someone who lives in the Northeast. Yeah. So to me, there's a very strong delineation between plants that grow outdoors and plants that grow indoors. Mm -hmm. You go to California and it's like, it's all the same. Yeah. So I didn't really understand that. And I didn't really understand the difference between my environment and my mother's environment. And so a lot of dead plants is what I'll say, which is another reason why I think the sill was a unique solution at the time because nobody was trying to educate the consumer to actually choose the plant that was correct for their environment. It was either, this is what's at the grocery store, 
Yeah. Or this is what's like interesting and unique and trendy, mm-hmm. irregardless of whether or not your home is the right space for it. That was 100% my experience. Yeah. I used to be an epic plant killer, a lot of dead plants, because plants. I would just buy my house plants at like the local bodega or like grocery store yeah. in New York City. Yeah. I didn't know their names and I would put them so far from my window. Like it was tragic. Yeah. And it was actually the sill. The sill was one oh. of the first accounts that I found. And I remember I used to live on the sill.com reading your plant care guides and reading all of the educational material you mm-hmm. gave trying to figure out, okay, but what is the plant that's going to work in my low right. light home? Right. Or what is the plant that's going to work, you know, under a grow light or right. whatever it was. Right. And I think too, with consumers, we're so disconnected from nature. We don't, it's not intuitive. No, for us. it's not. I mean, we need a lot of education. When I look back at our education, yeah, broadly, photosynthesis, maybe yeah. that's it. And yeah. that's like and that was in one grade. month in yeah. seventh grade. Mm-hmm. And the sill started in an era of grocery store plants where all of the tags would literally just say house plant. It's yeah. just like, oh yeah, house this, plant. Is, this is a tropical house plant. Yeah. And you're like, okay, but like, bright indirect light. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> mm-hmm. Maybe. And what does that mean? Yep. So I remember getting a receipt actually from Home Depot and wanting to reference what plant I purchased. And the receipt literally said house plant. Yeah. I was like, what? Well, which house plant? Mm -hmm. And they didn't know, but you could return it. Right. But that's not what I want to do. I didn't want to return it. I wanted it to thrive. Yeah. No, totally. What was the moment when you were having plants as this hobby that you thought, wow, I think I want to make this a business? Like, what did that first month look like? So, well, it's interesting because I actually came up with the concept of the sill when I was 21 Mm -hmm. and I didn't launch the business until I was 26. Okay. Um, Part of the reason why is because I had literally zero experience. Yeah. (laughs) So I didn't know how to start the company. Literally. I did Mm -hmm. not know how to start. That being said, the idea surprisingly actually hasn't even changed our positioning, the problem we're solving, our ethos. uh, Now, if we're talking over the span of not even just the 12 years of business, but since I concepted it has not changed. That's now oh, I can't do the math, 16 years, something like that. But when I, that first month, even, it was still, how do you take something that has never been properly, I don't want to say marketed, because that sounds almost too businessy, but Mm -hmm. tended to. Yeah. (laughs) Right? Planty puns. Planty puns are so welcome. Yeah. Um, And I'm also in New York, right? Mm -hmm. And so I grew up in Western Massachusetts. I didn't really come from a very like commercialistic, consumeristic Mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. Uh, And all of a sudden here I am in Manhattan and like, there's like 200 different types of soap. Yeah. Like 200 different shower curtains or 200 different throat. I mean, it was endless. And Mm -hmm. so what I was trying to understand was why then do I not have choice in this category? Yeah. And why isn't there someone that I can look to that's not Martha, which love Martha. Love Martha. Love Martha. Shout out. I know. But you know, I wasn't growing roses in Katona. Yep. Yep. No, totally. That's so real. It's like you took a spotlight and just shown you shown it on yes. on the house plan yeah. and it wasn't it was totally in the background, which right. is so funny coming out of the pandemic where I feel like then people were only talking about house yes. plants for so long. Yeah. So, looking at your 12 years of the sill, obviously plant puns, we both love them mm-hmm. so much. Mm-hmm. So, if we were to look at your journey in entrepreneurship in seasons, yes. Take us back to the beginning. Okay. What season was the beginning of the sill? And maybe we can walk through your entrepreneurial journey, growing the sill to the, you know, multi-million dollar brand that it is now and what each of those seasons looked like and the wins, the losses, yeah. all of it. The walk win- us through because we the, might have some aspiring. long winter. <laughs> yeah, the long winter. But I have a feeling we probably have aspiring entrepreneurs yeah. and yeah. it's scary. And it's always so interesting yeah. to hear, especially from women who, who yes. have done it successfully. Yes. So well. So it's interesting because obviously everything is a cycle. Yeah. So I would describe my, the start of my business as spring Mm -hmm. and I would describe the state that my business is in today as spring. Yeah. So we've come full circle. So we've come full circle and that's so exciting. So the initial stages of having an idea, I mean, of course you can draw the parallel. It's planting a seed. Yeah. And everything that's happening is actually happening below the soil, Mm. below the surface. You don't see anything. You don't know what the payoff is going to be. You're stressing. You're like looking at the seed germinating (laughs) mat every day being like, is it, did it pop yet? Or the, yeah, Yeah. totally. And um, what's crazy is I was at TPIE. I don't know if you guys have ever been because it's an industry trade show, but I went down to Florida. I did the tropical plant Mm -hmm. expo and I was handing out 
literally fake business cards because my business has. <gasps> I did that too. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I yes. love that. Okay. Fake it till you make it. I think okay. it was like Moo.com. Yes. Like whoever was making business cards back then. Yes. Or not even. It was like FedEx. And people were looking at me like I had 12 heads. So and like, it was just like your name at Gmail. Like yeah, it was, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Oh no, I'd already bought the domain for oh, $11. Okay. Oh my thankfully. God. <laughs> so Everyone's good. like, oh, how'd you come up with the name? And I'm like, it was $11. Right. So I went down and everyone looked at me like I had 12 heads because I said, oh, I'm going to sell plants online and I'm going to make house plants effectively a consumer brand. And that was spring. <laughs> yeah. Were they um, excited or did they look at you like you had three heads? I think they were skeptical. Okay. The consumer was excited. The industry was skeptical. Yeah. And I was excited. So that's all that mattered. Yeah. So the early days were definitely spring. I was doing literally everything myself. I had a website that you could shop on if you lived near me, because it meant that if you purchased something, I was going to go buy it from a wholesaler, pot it in my apartment, put it in a bag take the subway to your home, knock on your door and hand it to you. Wow. That was the sale 1.0. And we didn't start shipping nationally for two years. Imagine that beautiful harmony wafting its way through your home while you sit inside bundled up and warm. It reminds me of the Danish term hygge, spelled H-Y-G-G-E, which is all about creating a warm atmosphere and enjoying the good things in life with good people while being cozy. Whenever I hear my Wind River wind chimes waft throughout my home, especially in the winter while I'm bundled up inside, it immediately sets me at ease and reminds me to take a mindful moment with a deep breath. So for today's ad, Wind River Chimes is gifting you a moment of coziness to drop in, take a deep breath, and feel all the warm and cozies. This winter, treat yourself or someone you love to the mindfulness and coziness that comes along with these magical Wind River wind chimes and personalize it. You can use the code GROWINGJOY at windriverchimes.com to get a free engraving to any engravable wind chime to add a special element to your gift. They come in a variety of colors, sizes, and sounds, so head to windriverchimes.com to listen and learn, and don't forget to use code GROWINGJOY at checkout to receive a free engraving. So did you ship nationally before you had a storefront? It happened simultaneously. Oh, wow. Okay. So our first store and shipping nationally happened in 2014. And I would say our spring was long. Yeah. And I don't think enough people talk about this, is that actually building a business takes a lot of time mm. and yeah. a lot of patience. And there is no such thing as overnight success. And people ask me if I'm successful today. I'm like, I don't know. Jury's out. Yeah. So spring was long. Summer was amazing. Mm -hmm. From 2016, so 26, so I bootstrapped the business, which means I didn't take on any outside financing in the early days. Right. I bootstrapped it to north of a million dollars, mm -hmm. which felt cheers, amazing. Cheers amazing. to that. And that what was in 2016. It? And then I brought in some outside capital to support our growth, and it was glorious. Summer was also long. From 2016, I would almost argue through 2020 yeah was summer mm -hmm. I think winter started in 2020 also though yeah I said this to you when you were asking me about seasons I don't know where fall goes yeah what I actually said was well if you're like us who live in the northeast fall is kind of a shit show yeah it's hot it's cold nobody knows what's yeah. going on in fall so actually like maybe COVID was fall uh -huh. if you're from the northeast some wins some losses an early yeah. freeze yeah an yeah. early freeze like what's going on yeah. why is it summer in November mm -hmm. and then COVID was actually ended up being pretty tough on the business and which is surprising because I would think from an outside oh it's houseplants Eliza's and houseplants every yeah. houseplants are booming like yeah. this it must have been that it took off. So what was the struggle for you in COVID? So during, I mean, I think to run a business through COVID was yeah. just really hard for everyone. Yeah. I think being a business owner with so many unknowns mm. is really challenging. Obviously COVID was big for the consumer's interest in plants. So there's a positive, but the industry honestly actually couldn't support it. Yeah. We ran out of plants, which I didn't think was possible. Right. And then we had to deal with the fact that growers were concerned about how to invest in their growth. You know, this is a typically 
conservative industry. They don't want to take a ton of risks, mm-hmm. which is actually probably in the long run a good thing. Mm-hmm. And yet we had all of this interest. We didn't have enough product. And it started this imbalance for about 18 months. And it wasn't just on the plant side. You know, we sell decorative planters. It was the whole supply chain. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the consumer side, inflation, challenging economy, nobody knowing where anything's going. Yeah. So winter was tough, but I'm super optimistic that we are now officially in spring again. Woohoo! Which, yeah, woohoo is right. So I'm so excited. We are on solid footing as a business. I think customers now understand and recognize the power of houseplants. Mm-hmm. I think houseplants are a gateway into gardening, of course, but also other things that are great, like mm-hmm. self-care. Yeah. Like self-care, like environmentalism, like yes, caring for exactly. the earth, getting into sustainability. It's the gateway drug for living a happier life, however you want to call it, right? Absolutely. And a more uh, intentional life, Absolutely. I think. What kept getting you out of bed when you were in your winter and when you were mm-hmm. struggling? And I think we're seeing a lot of businesses right now that are kind of shuttering their doors, especially in the houseplant space, because yeah. the pandemic really threw everyone for a ride. Yeah. So what kept getting you to show up and fight for your company when it was hard. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of businesses that started during the pandemic honestly didn't appreciate how hard this industry is. Yeah. It's just hard. Running a business is hard to begin with. Running a plant business, I mean, you got to be tough. Yeah. With inventory that is, yeah. yeah. When your inventory dies. Dies. Yeah. You know, any of you who feel bad about killing a plant, I kill plants on a commercial level. (laughs) Like I kill way more plants than you guys kill. But what keeps me going is honestly knowing how big of an impact plants can have in people's lives. Mm. I mean, literally everything that your book is about. Yeah. So it's that connection. It's knowing that at the end of the day, this is an intrinsically good product. Yeah. This isn't the next best face cream, although I love a good face cream. Me too. So that is what keeps me going. And I actually think the experience we had in COVID was really validating in a way to make this feel even higher than sort of just being a transactional business that sold houseplants. It was like, we really are showing up for people and delivering a happier life. Yeah. I mean, plants make people happy. It's so deep. I hear from listeners, I'm sure you hear from consumers, how people are using their houseplants to cope with postpartum depression, to cope with post-traumatic stress disorder, to get through hard times, the emotional connections that people have with houseplants. It was gifted to me by my, you know, mom or, or all of these things. It's so much deeper than just like you said, the transaction. I want to ask you about the plants. So how, how do you source and get the plants? Do you work with one exclusive distributor? Like, what does that look like? What's the journey of getting the plants to your customers' homes? Thank you for asking that because not everybody does. Yeah. Oh. And it's interesting because it's a, like I said, it's sort of an older industry. Yeah. It's not like you can just Google this and find out where plants mm-hmm. come from. Although most people can figure out they come from Florida. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is the reality. But that's actually not true. A lot of our suppliers are in other states besides Florida. And we have been really lucky to, over the years, meet, find and meet mm-hmm. some really remarkable suppliers who are so dedicated to sustainability, Mm. to non-chemical practices, to growing really top quality product and actually listening not only to the retailers, but to the end consumer. Mm. And that has been one of the most satisfying parts of this is that I feel as if I've watched the industry really shift towards their exclusive customer being a big box retailer or even, you know, initially an independent guard center, but then really we were in the heyday of big box Mm -hmm. where they're so disconnected from the end consumer. And now they're starting to pay attention to retailers like my, like me, like the sill to understand that customers actually have really strong opinions about all of these big, big topics like sustainability. And that's been wonderful. So we get um, plants from Ohio, from North Carolina, from Florida, from California, and we have real relationships with these people. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's not like we're just flipping through a catalog and buying things. Like we're on the phone, we're doing site visits, we're understanding in depth all of their growing practices. Mm -hmm. And that's just super exciting. Yeah, that's so interesting. You mentioned also how you were saying, well, I don't know what my definition of success, I don't know. Do you feel like your definition of success has has changed in the different seasons as you've grown your business? Yes, because I've gotten older. Yeah. I think age has helped. Yeah. I think what matters to me in terms of what we build and sort of the legacy that the still leaves behind 
has shifted. I think actually during COVID in 2020 and beyond, I realized that one of the bigger impacts that I could have was actually on my team, mm. my employees more so than my customers or as important. Yeah, that's um, interesting. So there was like an interesting moment of like reflecting and, and looking inward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've talked about it here in other events, but I think representation really matters. Mm -hmm. And I think almost from that perspective alone, I feel very successful mm -hmm. in that I've been able to be where I am as a woman, as a person of color, and just show other people that they can do what I'm doing. Yeah. What has it been like to be a woman kick-ass leader <laughs> in this industry that is predominantly male yeah. run, right? Yeah. What has that been like, felt like for you over the last 12 years? It's felt awesome. Yeah. I feel awesome about it. Yes. No, I mean, there's... cheers again. That's <laughs> what a great answer. Uh, I'm going to drink again. Mm -hmm. This feels like a fun drinking game. I know. So, no, I mean, it, it's a really serious topic because this is a very male dominated industry. And I think part of the reason why I got, you know, the you have three heads look mm. when I went down to TPIEs, I didn't look like everybody else. I was yeah. younger, I was a woman. I was talking about online. I mean, all sorts of things. You were other in every single element. Yes, yeah, exactly, element. yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's been challenging, of course, but I think I take great pride and pleasure in sort of being the other. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs actually start their businesses because they like have a little chip on their shoulder. Yeah. Like I had a little something to prove. Yeah. And I think I've done it. And so no matter what happens with the business going forward, many businesses go through seasons mm -hmm. and cycles and not every business is meant to exist forever. Mm -hmm. But even still, I feel very pleased with the accomplishments that both I've made personally and the company and brand have made. I love that so much. And I think it's so important for younger entrepreneurs like myself to hear women like you owning their success and mm -hmm. owning that you feel good about this and owning that you did do the extraordinary. I mean, yeah. that's pretty impressive. And it inspires all of us here who are sitting, hoping to build something, you know, a fraction of, of what you've built. Thank you for saying that. Oh, absolutely. Let's talk about trends. What are you oh, seeing yeah. as trends in 2024? So it's interesting. Another thing that has strangely come full circle. So if you'd asked me a few years ago what the hottest house plant was, of course, it was the fiddle leaf fig tree. Yeah. Everyone is so sick of hearing about a fiddle leaf fig tree if you're a house plant lover because everyone wants one. Nobody can take care of yep. them. The uh, you spend $200 and then all the leaves all fall the leaves off. Fall That's off. always the issue. Yeah. And, but you know what? If you ask my mother, she'd be like, of course, they're going to fall off. It's a ficus. Right. <laughs> so, right. you know, we had to learn our lesson. But I think trees just conceptually mm -hmm. are coming back. So our number one item in the past 12 months has been an olive tree, um, which I find really interesting. Yeah. It's actually like the antithesis of a uh, ficus lorata because instead of having these big green leaves, yeah. it's got teeny tiny leaves. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the customer is just getting a little bit more confident yeah. and adventurous. And it's kind of exotic to be able yeah. to be like, I'm growing olives. And not yeah. that, I don't know if you can really grow the olives, but most people to can. <laughs> yeah, to have the olive tree. But like a lemon tree. I mean, yeah. I think anything that is a tree mm -hmm. that is intended to bear fruit yeah. is something that we're going to see a lot of. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly we are, and mm -hmm. we're very excited for that. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of that. And what I love about that is, again, that feels like a real gateway to the outdoors. Yeah, I love that. I feel like too, the trees also speaks to, you know, in the pandemic, it was maximalist. It was how many yes. houseplants can I have it inside? Jungle. It was jungle. Yeah. And people now have gone back to their real lives. They've gone back to work. They've gone back to commuting yeah. and they can't sustain the 200, 200 or 300. Yeah. And so I feel like I'm seeing a little bit of a minimalism moment yeah. and to have the one tree, like mm -hmm. kind of statement tree in mm -hmm. the corner instead of 40 smaller houseplants mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense to me too. Yeah. That's very interesting. And then, you know, you just kind of alluded to outdoors to an olive tree, which was something you didn't used to sell. I right. remember when I used to shop with you when I lived in New York City. What is coming up for the sill? Yeah. Like, what can we be excited about? Well, besides I, the new sweatshirt, which I sweatshirt, want yes. and need. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I feel like that was a little foreshadowing. Yeah. We're going to be getting a little bit outside of ourselves, which will be interesting mm -hmm. considering we are called the sill. Right. Um, and we've very much been in our houseplant world, but yeah. I feel our customer has really grown up. 
Our customer is living in houses. They're not just in apartments. And we have all built confidence. Like we can do this. Mm -hmm. And we've also seen the payback. Yeah. So I think that's also like the most important thing is look at this relationship I have with this little house plant. Mm -hmm. What might it be like to step outside the garden? Yeah. On the other side of the sill, you're just looking, you're looking in the sill instead of looking out of the sill now. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But also so many people have balconies. I mean, when I lived in New York city and I was shopping at the sill, I had a tiny balcony garden and then I had all my indoor house plants, you know, so makes total sense. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. What are your hobbies outside of plants? (laughs) Do you have hobbies outside of plants? Do I have hobbies? I have kids. You have kids. You have cute kids. So I don't know. I, yeah. I guess what are what are your kids' hobbies? What are my Maybe kids? I know. Those are your my hobbies. hobbies are um, going to five year olds' birthday parties. Right. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> um, no, I I mean in all seriousness, I love spending time outside. Mm-hmm. I love obviously spending time with my family. Yeah. And I'm really enjoying sort of this season, actually, of my life of spending more time at home Mm -hmm. in a totally different capacity than I used to spend time at home in before. Before it would be like sweatpants and Netflix. Now it's like baking muffins with the kids at 630 in the morning. Oh, my God. That's fun. That's so trad life of you. Do you garden at your home? So Eliza and I actually both lived in small apartments in New York City and both have run for the hills. And now we live. You know, about two in the literal hills in the woods and about two hours north. So do you garden on your property now outdoors too? I do. And I'm like a really good weeder. Mm. Like that has been like serious stress management. Yes, I fully agree. I actually only want to weed. Me too. Like let me at your garden. Let me just rip it out. I want to be in demolition. I yes, think I just want, exactly. I don't even need to plant. I, I just, just want, want to rip it all out and chuck. Yeah. And it feels so good. Yeah. And so I do. Love that. <laughs> I love that. I have, oh my God. Can I come weed with yeah. you? I'm not, and, I don't live that far from you. And no. then I also <laughs> move things around, which is actually like probably not wise. Mm-hmm. So like I have peonies that just like refuse to bloom because I keep moving them. So, um, <laughs> There's some gardening happening. I wouldn't call it successful gardening, but yeah. like anything else in life, it just takes time. Well, and I think that's the beauty of plants, right? Because for a lot of your, I'm a great example because I shopped at the cell weekly, you know, when I was <laughs> living in New York City, you start with house plants, then you get a windowsill, then yeah. you get a little windowsill balcony, and yeah. maybe you do a flower or a tomato or herbs, yeah. then you move, then all of a sudden you've got land yeah. and you get to just be this eternal student. Yes. You just get to always, and it. It speaks to the fact that Eliza, the founder of the Sill, is still a student in her garden outdoors. Mm-hmm. Like that's the beauty of plants is that when we're 80, we'll still be able to be stimulating our mind Absolutely. in a different capacity. And by the way, the zones will all change by the time we're 80. <laughs> and by the way, we'll all be gardening in new zones by the time we yeah. get there. Yeah. We're kind of at time. We're going to take some questions from the audience, but I'd love to close out. Do you have a fun or, you know, inspiring favorite client or story from, from one of your customers that is warm and fuzzy that will leave us all going home feeling good so i have a folder on my computer Mm. called the love folder and it's screenshots of customers over the years who have written in either publicly posted or written to us directly who everything from like the very like light-hearted hey you know i just love your company yeah wish it had always existed to some really heartfelt messages and one of them was literally about this woman who came into our first store, which by the way, our first store was a total dump. It was amazing. What are you talking about? The Chinatown store? It was a total dump. It was amazing. Uh, It was little, but it was, it was was, awesome. It was like a kiosk with four walls and she never had a plant before. Peggy, Mm -hmm. who uh was working in the store at the time, sold her a plant, told her everything she needed to know to take care of it. And she wrote us and said, I really didn't believe I could do it. And when I realized that I could, I realized that I could do so much more. Mm -hmm. And she had this amazing transformative story about how she was actually dealing with some real significant health issues. And this motivated her to turn her health around. And she did. Wow. Because of a house plan. It was, I mean, it's like my, it's like highlighted and bolded and it's there. And whenever I'm having a down day, I just read that and it all makes it melt away. Oh man. What a beautiful story. Plants are so deep. They're so much more than a little windowsill decoration thank you so much for being here today and eliza thank thank you 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 can go learn about eliza at the sill follow the sill on social media um your podcast is growing joy with plants growing joy with maria.com as well 
All right. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, yeah. yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Last One last cheers as I've drained this Negroni. <laughs> so good. Thank you, Eliza, for all of your support of this podcast from when it launched as Bloom and Grow Radio. You know, like I said in our interview, the Sill was one of the first people to say, yes, how can we help? Let's promote you. Let's feature you. Let's give you our plant scientist as a resource. They've always been so supportive of me, and I'm so thankful to them and thankful to Eliza for building this brand, but also being inclusive and and opening arms to the growing plant influencers that, like myself, that growing plant creators like myself when we needed some support. I just love her. And her story is really just so inspiring as a female entrepreneur, as a person, as a plant lover. She's changed this community forever. And I'm so thankful that we got the chance to highlight her personal journey. And I hope this was interesting. Let me know if you like these entrepreneur profiles, interviews. I'd love to do more because there are so many interesting brands in the houseplant and garden space that have really cool stories. And I've loved all of the kind of entrepreneurship interviews that we've done about plant brands because the horticulture industry is a very interesting space and it's different than other spaces. And I just think as a consumer who has bought so many plants and so many plant accessories, it's always interesting hearing about the passionate people behind these brands bringing these products to us. I also wanted to give a special thanks to the Northwest Flower and Garden Festival. Thanks for having me. Thanks for bringing me to Seattle and Espoma Organic. They actually brought me out to Seattle and supported me while I was talking. It was just the best time. And if you know of other flower shows that I should be attending this year, please let me know. You can always slide into my DMs at Growing Joy with Maria on Instagram, or you can email me at Maria at growingjoywithmaria.com. So I hope this podcast was interesting. I hope you are inspired. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the plant parent personality test. It's free. It's super fun. It takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're going to get your plant parent personality profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.